shadow of London's Westminster Abbey in Central Hall is held the first meeting of the General Assembly United Nations Organization. At the entrance to the hall, crowds congregate to watch the arrival of the delegates. Hundreds queue in the hope of getting one of the 300 seats allotted in the public gallery. Public interest runs high all over the world in the initial meeting of UNO. A spirit of optimism in the success of the great undertaking prevails among the delegates from 51 nations as they arrive for the opening session. The official crest of UNO looks down on 2,000 statesmen, diplomats, and economic experts from the four corners of the globe. Names which are famous throughout the world gather in the great assembly hall to take the first steps on the rugged road which lies ahead, the road to perpetual peace. With preliminary details concluded, the first business before the house is the choosing of a president for the organization. Two names go to the assembly for a final vote by secret ballot. They are those of Monsieur Lee, the foreign minister of Norway, and Monsieur Spack of Belgium. Each delegate casts a vote for his chosen candidate and independent observers tally up the total. In accordance with the rules of procedure, I declare Mr. Spark for elected president, and I invite him to take his seat as president of the assembly. Taking over from the temporary chairman, Monsieur Spack assumes control. He is elected by a majority of five votes. Lee of Norway, 23, Spack of Belgium, 28. Pour maintenant déclarer ouverte la première séance de la première assemblée des Nations Unies. So opens UNO's first session. In it is placed the sacred trust of millions who look forward to the maintenance in future years of prosperity and goodwill under the banner of universal peace. Along the highways of Canadian-occupied Germany, trees by the hundreds are falling to the woodsman's axe. Jerry labor is permitted to fell trees which are dead or partially decayed for the wherewithal to ward off the cold of winter. Transportation by road and rail is not sufficient to bring enough coal for power and industry. Germans are therefore on their own when it comes to providing fuel for home consumption. In the cities, wood is rationed at the rate of 200 pounds per family per week on a coupon basis. In the country, the natives gather their own. They make the most of their opportunity. Widely used fuel is peat, and nearly every house has its peat pile. Cut during the summer, it has been piled to dry. Now it is proving a handy commodity as the winter winds howl. Realizing that they have to look after themselves, Germans are busy getting on with the job as life slowly moves back to normal. On the square at CRU Aldershot, Field Marshal Alexander presides at a ceremony in which the Lake Superior Regiment is the star attraction. Lieutenant Colonel Parker, OC of the unit, greets the inspecting party, which includes Lieutenant General Murchie, Chief of Staff of CMHQ, and Brigadier Blackader, OC of CRU. Canada's future Governor General inspects the regiment. Before their return home, the Lake Superiors received new regimental colors at an impressive parade. Originally an infantry battalion, the superiors became a motorized unit when 4th Division was changed over to an armored div. They saw action in some of the toughest shows of the Western Front as the recce battalion of 4th Armored Brigade. The 
course, to take with them the lads from the lakehead, after a job well done, are headed for the boat which will take them home. In Germany, a 60 hundredweight lorry is fitted as a portable recording studio. Members of the CAOF become recording artists overnight. Sitting in front of a microphone reading their own script, they wax three minutes of anything they desire for the folks back home. Even music is supplied if they have a yen to sing or want a sentimental background. On a small black disc can go everything from a love song to a letter to the family lawyer. Maybe Johnny doesn't rate three stars in the hit parade, but his voice will sound mighty good to somebody back in Canada. On completion, the disc is wrapped and mailed to its destination. To his loved ones, Johnny's voice will win an Oscar, and all for the sum of two marks. As each Canadian unit on the continent is repatriated, its vehicles are left behind and demarked. First of all, the RCEME carry on the gigantic task of classifying and documenting each unit of transport. Everyone is given its type mark, and a receipt for it is handed over to the driver. From there on, they become the responsibility of the personnel in charge of the Canadian Army vehicle demob park. Radiators are drained and the truck stored in apple pie order. The great autumn airport, which the Germans were developing into one of the most important airfields in Western Europe, is the scene of the concentration. Up to date, approximately 36,000 vehicles are stored in the park, and more arrive daily. The transport which carried a victorious army all the way from the beaches of Normandy to the broken bastions of the Reich has seen its last engagement. black marketeers get ideas, the park is guarded by a three-coiled barbed wire fence and electrified wires. When it is complete, the concentration will be turned over to the War Assets Board. They will sell it and thus bring money back to the Treasury. France, Belgium and Holland already are bargaining for the whole establishment. So in years to come, the Canadian vehicles which helped free enslaved Europe will play their part in its peaceful reconstruction. Boomtown of Yellowknife in Canada's Northwest Territories hits news headlines again as a rich gold fault is found directly under its main street. In the summer of 1945, one of the greatest hard rock gold rushes of history was on. Ever since, prospectors have been swarming into the north in quest of the magic metal. More than 10,000 claims are now filed with the Dominion government. Overnight, Yellowknife springs up from a tent town into a city of shacks. Most commodities must be hauled over a thousand miles by rail and water, or if you're rich, by air. Trails of yesterday become the streets of today. Men stampede to get set before the winter freezes them in at 50 below. As merchants with an eye for business open their shops, many great minds of the future spring into being. If you're a would-be prospector, you can travel in by plane with all your gear. To get even a show in the great gamble, you need a grub stake of $1,000. The stakes are a fortune, or nothing, and the keynote of the whole game is hard work. When a likely vein is discovered, a diamond drill is flown in. The plant has brought piecemeal from Edmonton and is set up to make a test. Drilling into the earth to a depth of four to 800 feet, samples are taken to determine the richness of the deposit. If the results are good, the claim is up for sale. If a million dollars can be found for development, a mine is started. Day by day, the ceaseless hunt goes on for the precious mineral. The modern prospector is often a college-trained geologist. He uses modern methods in his search. When a vein is discovered, it is compass checked and claim posts are set up. The next step is to file the claim and a new mine is born. Samples are taken back to town for smelting and analysis. Between giant and consolidated mines in the heart of Yellowknife town, the richest fault of the district has been discovered. Now the whole town must be moved to expedite working the vein. So a war of movement is fought for gold in the world's greatest boom town, Yellowknife.